Welcome. This video covers staffing defect. It was created for radiographic interpretations under course director Sung Kim DDS. Today we will be discussing the staffing defect. Let us take a look at the definition and some background information on the staffing defect. Staphne bone cavity or Staphne bone defect is a rare mandibular defect that was first reported by Edward C. Staphne in 1942. It commonly presents with a well demarcated asymptomatic unilateral radiolucency that indicates the lingual invagination of the cortical bone. Other names for the Staphne bone defect include Staphne bone cyst, latent bone cyst, static bone cyst, static bone defect, lingual cortical mandibular defect, and lingual mandibular salivary gland depression. These lesions are usually discovered by chance, mostly through the conventional radiological examination process, and are often erroneously identified as traumatic lesions or mass lesions of the chin. They have a significant male predilection, with 80 to 90% of cases seen in men. At the bottom, we see a classic pantomograph of the SBD below the mandibular canal. Next, we'll take a look at the clinical findings of the Staphne defect. There are very rare cases where a Staphne cyst will bring in a patient complaining of pain, swelling, or any other symptoms. Clinically, it is unlikely that a practitioner will see any signs of inflammation or signs of growth of a tumor. In the few cases that swelling is present, it is usually seen near the angle of the mandible, usually inferior to the region where the second and third molars are located. The swelling can often be seen more anterior to the angle. However, it is highly unlikely to be seen in the ramus area. The swelling seen is not consistent with the type of swelling that occurs with lymph adenopathy, nor parotid gland inflammation. Therefore, there is no foul taste, purulence, dry mouth, swelling of the neck, fever, ch or chills. There is no changing of size of the swelling, no symptoms of pain, and no systemic signs that might suggest this due to an infection or malignancy. The extremely rare outlier cases have more noticeable changes that can be visualized clinically. Characteristics that can be seen include a significant enlargement over a lengthy period of time. And enlargements can be so severe that there is a great risk of a fragile or eventually fractured mandible. Therefore, there is, there is also likely to be vestibular resorption of the buccal cortex in these cases. Chin deviation has been noted in patients with a Staphne cyst. However, this has been noted in very few cases. This image shows a patient with staphne cyst that has resulting swelling of the right man mandible with slight associated chin deviation to the affected side. The staphne bone defect is commonly well corticated, well defined, and rarely found above the mandibular canal, suggesting non odontogenic origin. Now the lesion is generally benign in nature meaning it doesn't normally cause any resorption, but it can rarely cause buccal plate expansion, which can be seen clinically. To check for buccal expansion and tr the true extent of the lesion, we must, be, we must be given a CBCT image. In the image given below, we can see a clearly demarcated, well-defined SBD that is sitting below the mandibular canal. From the panoramic radiograph, it is not quite clear whether the lesion has caused buccal expansion, but we can see that the inferior mandible, uh, the inferior border of the mandible is still intact. This slide shows an example image of the type 2 defect that is classically found under the mandibular canal and near the molars and on the lingual side. The defect created a lingual concavity that extends very close to the buccal cortical plate, but does not cause its expansion. Thus, we can derive that this patient may not display any clinical signs. Now, Staphne bone defect can be found in one of four places. One, the anterior mandible near the incisor premolar area. Two, under the mandibular canal near the mandibular molars, which is the most common location for this lesion to occur. Three, on the lingual side of the ascending ramus. Or four, on the buccal side of the ascending ramus. Though there may be possibilities, these 
there, though there may be other possibilities, these are the four most common areas where the lesion can be found, near the mandibular molars being the most common. As previously stated, SVD can cause anatomical disturbances such as buccal plate expansion. If given a CBCT of the defect, we can categorize the defect into three types based on its depth into the mandible. Type one, which would mean the defect has penetrated the lingual plate but is nowhere near the buccal cortical plate. Type two, which means the lesion is near the buccal cortical plate and type three, which means the lesion has pierced the lingual cortical plate and caused the expansion of the buccal cortical plate. Several other conditions causing radiolucent voids in the posterior mandible should be considered in the differential diagnosis for staph knee defect. Odontogenic keratosis, abbreviated to OKC, central giant cell granuloma, and Langerhans cell histiocytosis all exhibit similar radiographic findings to staph knee defect. That being said, staph knee defect does have several indications that can lead to a diagnosis. Staph knee defect lesions display a connection to the inferior border of the mandible. These lesions are typically found in the posterior mandible in the third molar region. The lingual bone depression will tend to be below the inferior alveolar canal. Though the vast majority of staph knee defects are unilocular, it may be spread outward from the initial lesion. Now we will look at how to better differentiate between SBD and radiographically similar lesions. OKC is a developmental lesion originating from dental lamina. Radiographically, OKC appears expansile and well corticated. A key distinguishing feature between OKC and staph knee defect is the location of the lesion. OKC lesions will be located above the mandibular canal due to the odontogenic origin. Staph knee defects occur below the mandibular canal because it is a non-odontogenic lesion. Root resorption and the possibility of multilocular lesions are also seen in OKC lesions. Next, central giant cell granuloma should be considered in the differential diagnosis for staph knee defect. Similar to staph knee defect, central giant cell granuloma is an asymptomatic, slow-growing lesion. CGCG is significantly more aggressive than staph knee defect lesions and often causes root resorption with displacement. Staph knee defect lesions are non-odontogenic and take place below the mandibular canal or in the ramus. And due to this, it is almost never associated with root apices. CGCG can present as a wide variety of lesions ranging from small unilocular lesions to multilocular lesions large enough to displace teeth. CGCG lesions can also display root resorption and cortical plate perforation. CGCG also has a slight predilection for females. Finally, longer Hans cell histiocytosis should be considered. These lesions do not exhibit pathognomonic radiographic features and require diagnosis via, via tissue biopsy. Unlike staph knee defect, Langerhans longer cell histiocytosis is a multi-systemic disease and lesions will most likely exist outside the oral cavity, such as the skull, ribs, invertebrate, and long bones. Only 10% of Langerhans cell histiocytosis patients will suffer from oral lesions. This disease will present early in life, generally around one to three years of age, and should be considered a true malignancy. The panel shown displays eosinic phyllic granuloma lesions below the mandibular canal, where one would expect to find staph knee defect. A distinguishing feature is the presence of multiple radiolucencies affecting multiple quadrants. Staph knee defect, on the other hand, is predominantly always a single defect. Next, we will discuss treatment options for staph knee defect. As previously stated, the SBD is not a pathological condition and thus requires no further treatment. It is merely an invagination of cortical bone near the molar area of the mandible, usually in older men. The cavity is often simply empty or filled with adipose tissue. For a definitive diagnosis, it needs to be imaged with either CBCT or MRI scan. Here are our references. Here are our image citations. And thank you for your time.